All right, hi, I'm Nathan, and today I'm going to talk to you about DynamoDB indexes. Can I quickly see who knows about DynamoDB already and uses it? Cool. All right, well, firstly about me. I've been building enterprise software for the last 15 years or so. Um, I've used a variety of different database technologies, and in the last five years or so, I've really started to come to appreciate that boost in developer productivity I've seen from document-oriented databases like DynamoDB. <clears throat> the last 16 months I've been building the Century Bay platform using DynamoDB quite heavily, so today I want to tell you about some of the things I've learned along the way. <coughs> so Century Bay is a digital, digital assets and payments platform, and <coughs> we allow anyone to transact anything anywhere. We already have uh, a majority of New Zealand payment terminals capable of accepting digital assets through our platform using the QR code payment flow. I'm going to break this talk down into three parts. I'm going to start by talking about some DynamoDB core concepts, then I'll talk about indexes in DynamoDB, and then I'll finish up with some patterns for success with DynamoDB that I've learned. So DynamoDB is a document-oriented database. It's been around about a decade. It's serverless and schemaless. You don't have to manage servers. It supports transactions, so it's really good for OLTP workloads, and it's very highly scalable. What it doesn't do is reporting and search, so you need to be aware of that when you're choosing DynamoDB. I've used Mongo and Firebase and in my experience, from a developer point of view, I'd say that it's very using DynamoDB has been really similar. I've found that knowledge in these areas has helped me along the way. And reading documentation, I also see it, Cassandra, from what I read, it looks like it's pretty similar as well. So if you're familiar with these, then DynamoDB should be pretty familiar. So in DynamoDB, we basically have items and tables. An item is a document that can be up to 400 kilobytes in size. And a table is a collection of documents that is unbounded. Every item <clears throat> is identified by a primary, sorry, a partition key and a sort key. Depending on which documentation or tooling you're looking at, it might also be called the hash and range attributes. So here we've got an example. We have a users table and it contains users. And we've decided to identify the users by the user ID. Sounds pretty straightforward, right? Um, in this case, we didn't need a sort key. And in this example, we've got a user preferences table. We've decided to partition by user ID and then use the name of the preference as the sort key. When another document comes along and it's got the same partition key and sort key as an existing document, then we can tell DynamoDB that we want to either replace that document or reject the transaction. DynamoDB tables don't need to contain one type of document. In fact, it's a common and encouraged pattern to have what we call heterogeneous tables, where we have a mixture of different document types. So in this example, we've got users and user preferences stored together inside the same table. And that enables uh, what we would typically use joins for in a relational database. We can enable by doing this heterogeneous table in DynamoDB. So when we're querying for documents, we always have to specify the partition key in its entirety. In this example, we've got user preferences. We've provided the partition key, which is the user ID. We're going to get back all of the preferences for that user. We could also provide this sort key when we're querying, and then get back one document that matches exactly the partition key and the sort key. Or we could use a starts with semantic and get back a subset of records, get back the user preferences that start with email in this case. In DynamoDB, all items land on a partition. A partition can contain a mixture of documents with different partition keys, but all documents with the same partition key will be on the same partition. And this is what gives DynamoDB its unbounded horizontal scalability. So behind the scenes, when a request comes into DynamoDB, what's going to happen is there's a request router that's going to figure out which partition is responsible for servicing that request. 
The reason that's possible is because every request, regardless of whether it's a write or a read request, you're always specifying the exact partition key. The request router is going to hash that partition key and then use that to figure out which partition is responsible. The so partitions have read-write capacity. The read-write capacity is uh, basically uh, proportional to, the units are proportional to kilobytes per second. And that, that, that capacity is a level that's set across a DynamoDB index. But the utilization is something that's measured per partition. When a partition exceeds the capacity, it's going to get a capacity exceeded exception. You're going to get effectively rate limited. So if you want to avoid being rate limited with your read or, reads or writes to DynamoDB, you have to make sure that that capacity level is set high enough such that your partition with the highest amount of load is coming under that level. But the billing for DynamoDB is proportional to the capacity level you set. So what you actually want to do is distribute the load evenly as possible across all of the partitions so that you can lower that capacity level down as low as possible to minimize your expenses. Uh, that capacity level can be set manually or it can be adjusted automatically based on load. <clears throat> and DynamoDB also has some, some level of spikes that you can go into above the capacity level for a short amount of time for some, some partitions and also it can be intelligently moving documents into different partitions, isolated partitions, if they are causing too much load on a partition. Behind the scenes also, DynamoDB is going to make sure that our documents are highly available so there's going to be some kind of replication across multiple availability zones. And finally, there's a feature called Global Tables that allows us to automatically replicate data across regions. We might want to do that for purposes of availability or performance. So what is an index? Let's say we've got a data set, collection of users, and we want to find a user by its ID. If we don't have an index, how are we going to do that? Basically, we need to start from the top and work our way down, scanning through the collection until we find it. And this is okay for a small number of lists. It's what we often do in the programming language, but when you've got billions of records or millions of records, this isn't going to scale. So an index is a secondary data structure that sits alongside our data set that is typically some kind of B tree, and it lets us efficiently query the data set regardless of how large that data set grows. In DynamoDB, every index must define an, an attribute that's nominated as the partition key. It can optionally nominate an attribute as a sort key, and it can optionally choose other attributes to project into the index. It also can define permissions and read-write capacity. There's three types of indexes in DynamoDB. There's a primary index, which every table must have, and then there's two secondary types of secondary index, which you can choose to add to any table. The primary index, it's identifying and strongly consistent. By identifying, what we mean is that there can only be one document inside the primary index with a given partition key and sort key combination. And it's strongly consistent. What that means is that any read against the primary index can be guaranteed by DynamoDB to be the latest, returning the latest version of the document out of that index. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you an example here. Um, we want to have a table which contains sessions. So the user logs in to your system and you generate a session. Um, and the, the session is matched to a user um, using a device. So what we're going to do is just use the session ID as the primary partition key. And that allows us to, with strong consistency, write a, a session to the table. And then using that same ID, immediately we can read it back by that ID. 
the Global Secondary Index is not identifying, so there can be multiple documents in the, sec in the secondary index which have the same partition key and sort key combination. And it's eventually consistent, so that means that DynamoDB cannot guarantee that when we're reading from the secondary index that we're getting the latest version of a document. So going back to our session example, we've got the session that has the primary partition key at the top in black, which is the session ID, and we're adding a second index. The second index, what we want to do with this is to find all of the sessions that have been recently created for a device so that we can log them all out because our device has been lost or stolen. So what we'll do is create a, a secondary index with the partition key set as the device ID and the sort key defined as the created date. When we query against that, we can uh, get the latest, latest session for a device and log it out. It's worth pointing out that we don't actually write to secondary indexes. We're writing to the primary index, and then behind the scenes, there's an asynchronous replication that's populating the secondary index. And that's why we cannot guarantee with strong consistency that we're reading the latest version of a document when we query the secondary index, because there might be another write that hasn't been replicated across yet when we're reading. Local secondary indexes, basically exactly like global secondary indexes, except they have the additional characteristic that they can be strongly consistent. However, they come with a whole host of drawbacks. So unless you can use the same partition key as the primary index and tolerate these other drawbacks, then you, you're probably not going to use local secondary indexes. Personally, I haven't used them yet. I haven't found a use, use case where I needed them. So, patterns for success. Number one, use a generic primary PK and SK, SK attributes. So, Basically, if we think back to where we talked about heterogeneous tables, we, we might not know exactly what types of entities we're going to put into our table when we first start designing it, and it might come quite, quite difficult to rework things if, we tur if it turns out that the, maybe the user ID wasn't quite the right, right uh, name for the primary thing and then the primary partition key, and then we decide we're going to reuse it for some other purpose, and then it's mis misnamed, and then you've got to have this extra cognitive burden to keep track of our user ID and this table actually means something else. So what we, what we do, pretty much universally, whenever we define a table in DynamoDB, the primary partition key is simply called PK and the primary sort key is simply called SK. And the values that go into those attributes are typically the name of the entity that's in there and then a hash and then the ID of that entity. Never use mutable data as the primary partition key. In this example, I've got a customer record, and a customer is owned by an organization. So we've chosen to use, for convenience, the org ID as the primary partition key. The benefit that gives us is that we can use strongly consistent reads to get all of the customers for an org as soon as they've been written. And maybe we thought that was convenient because it meant we didn't have to build retry behavior into our front end. But what happens if later on there's a requirement where the org um, that is owned by a customer actually changes? We need to move that customer to a different org. Well, the primary partition key is part of the primary identifier for the resource. If we change that value, then we're changing the identity of that resource. And that's basically causing a lot of trouble and it's going to be difficult to migrate that data. So essentially we want to choose primary identifiers that are stable, that will never change. So in this case what we want to do, what's a better approach, is to just use the customer's ID as the primary partition key for this document and then tolerate the eventual consistency that we get when we want to query for customers by org. Often, secondary indexes require us to generate computed attributes inside our application code. In this example, I've got an SQL query on the left, where I'm querying by 
org ID status and updated date. These are three attributes I'm querying by, but DynamoDB doesn't let us query by more than two attributes, the partition key and the sort key. So in order to satisfy this query in DynamoDB, we have to join those attributes together into a computed column, and it's the applications, application layer responsibility. The data, database doesn't do this for us. So in this case, uh, because I want to uh, query by status and order by updated app, what I'm going to do is generate a computed attribute on my document which concatenates those two attributes together and then I'm going to be able to issue a query where the partition key is the org ID I'm looking for and the status, uh, sorry, the sort key that I'm querying against starts with the waiting status and that's going to give me all of the re results ordered by updated day, updated app. This is basically the same example again, but it's just pointing out that um, DynamoDB secondary indexes support sparse data sets. So if a document has its value for, that's used as the sort key or partition key for a secondary index, if that attribute gets deleted, and in this case the order was changed to processed, so we just, instead of changing the secondary sort key to the processed hash and then the updated date, we just deleted that attribute. And because we deleted that attribute, the stock entire document will get dropped from the secondary index. Now because the primary index it guarantees that only one document with the same ID can exist, and DynamoDB supports writing multiple documents together in a single transaction, that allows us to implement unique constraints on it any number of additional attributes on the documents that we're storing in DynamoDB. So in this example, we've got a user who has a unique ID. That unique ID is used to form the primary identifier for the primary index, but it's got an additional handle attribute which we also want to enforce as unique. Uh, and in order to, to enforce this, all we do is when we create that user, we additionally craft a special unique user handle document which uses that user handle as part of that document's primary, uh, primary identifier and we write them together and we write them such and we, that we tell DynamoDB to roll back the transaction if there's a unique constraint violation on that second document. So that guarantees that we only ever create one user with the same handle. Now optimistic locking is a mechanism by which we guarantee that two requests that come into our system don't co conflict with each other. One of them's going to win and one of them's going to get rejected and sent back to the client that's calling and they, where they can retry. This pattern is basically using the exact same strategy as the previous one we saw, but instead of just writing that one unique constraint document up front when we first create the resource, every time we update the resource, we're incrementing a version number and writing that version document alongside it in a transaction which includes both documents. And then the transaction's either going to succeed or there's going to be a conflict because another transaction with the same identifiers come along and it will get rolled back. This is really important for us where we're trying to do things like guaranteeing that users don't get double charged when they're using our platform. All of these examples I've shown up till now kind of indicated that you can use sequential numeric identifiers, but DynamoDB does not support sequences or um, you know, creating sequential identifiers or anything like that. So it's generally the pattern that we will just use a random ID as the identifier for any document. So even if our documents are evenly distributed across all of our partitions, that doesn't mean the load on our system is evenly distributed. So Look, this picture is showing one user generating 80% of the load on our system. If this user was issuing queries which were based on the user ID, then 80% of the traffic that is used against that partition, sorry, 80% of the traffic for this part of the system that we're looking at would be using, landing on the exact same partition because that same user ID has been used as the partition key and it would be directing traffic to the same partition 
in our DynamoDB table. So in that case, we just need to be mindful of that. There might be other ways to break up our data so that we don't use the user ID as the partition key for those queries. Um, and maybe sometimes it's not, avo not avoidable, but it's just important to be aware of it. Okay, so but what can we do in the case where we do have too much load going onto one partition? So in this case, this example has an import job, which is some document that we put into a table and we want to query by the status um, of pending so that our, our background worker can pin them. Um, but all of those pending jobs on that secondary index, they're all going to be on the same partition. And that's probably fine for a, um, up until a certain amount of scale, but at some point this query is not going to perform very well because it's putting too much load on one partition. So the strategy that basically we can take is to append a, a sharding suffix. So in this case, you can see I've added a number 15. So what we're doing when we create these records is just choosing a random number between, say, 0 and 15, and appending that at the end, and then writing that to the table. Then when we query, we're actually going to issue 16 queries in parallel and read all of those query results back, join them all together and process them in parallel. The reason this works is because the DynamoDB load that we're generating, it's measured in the uh, number of kilobytes that we're reading or writing. And it's not based on the number of queries. So by distributing that more evenly, we can actually lower our utilization down to below that level that we don't want to cross where we start getting rejected. And finally, as requirements change, we might need to add new types of queries with new indexes to support those queries. And oftentimes, those new indexes are going to require us to backfill attributes in our data model, in our, in our data set, with new computed values to support these new indexes. Doing that should be automated. We couldn't find a good tool for this, so we built our own migration tool for DynamoDB. If you're interested, let me know and we'll look at open sourcing it for the community. So wrapping up, using DynamoDB effectively, basically it's all about using the right keys for your indexes. They need to be chosen carefully. We can also leverage heterogeneous tables and multi-item transactions to do some pretty powerful stuff with DynamoDB, such as um, optimistic locking. And at the end of the day, in order to get DynamoDB to scale, like it says on the tin, we need to make sure we're trying to distribute our load evenly across all of our partitions. I've added in some links here for you. I'll upload these uh, slides later on so you can find these if you're interested. Um, these are probably the best resources that I've found for getting started, and I can't recommend highly enough the data modeling video from Alex Debris. I found that immensely helpful when I was getting started out with DynamoDB. And of course, the obligatory <laughs> ad for Central Pay. We're hiring, so if you're interested, then there's a job on the LinkedIn there you can click on and apply. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions on DynamoDB? I just have questions about migrations. How do you do the migrations? Is it on client side or is it on DynamoDB side or is it on when you read a, you run the script on all the data? When we deploy our application, we're deploying um, we're, we're deploying workloads into Kubernetes, and as part of our deployment descriptor, we deploy an extra container which runs our migration tool. So, so every, you every, migrate all the existing data in DynamoDB, right? Yeah, we scan, we scan, we scan, well, the, 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 the migration script will choose what it wants to do. Oftentimes that means out of the table that it needs to migrate, it'll scan the table and every record will get migrated. Okay. It'll figure out, do I need to migrate this and scan yeah. through the entire record. We're still, we're still scaling up. I'm sure we're going to run, I'm sure this tool's going to run into problems, but for the scale that we're at at the moment, it's working fine. Yeah, but... Is that cost too much? Because you rewrite every record in, in that would be, but when you read the data, some record just slip like forever. 
So usually like the read and write capacities, you need to buy more than the, the rest, right? I don't think it's, well, maybe we'll see, but I don't think it's going to be a problem because the migration script is going to produce pretty even load across the partitions because it's not just migrating one partition at a time. Uh, if you can disclose, this, uh, so in that migration script, when you are migrating, uh, how much of the data load you are uh, talking about? Like gigabytes or? Not that much yet. No, not much yet. Like we're talking 20,000 records or something. Our main, our main, our main table, which contains our, the most number of records, is still in Mongo, and we haven't done any migrations on that yet. Next question: um, Have you looked at using EMR for doing the backfilling of, of records? Not really. I've looked at EMR briefly, but I haven't got experience with it. So, yeah, this is this was a quick and dirty job that did it well. It was easy. It just fitted in with our existing tooling and. Mm. Are you using EMR for back? Yeah, we're, we're for back culling, um, when we're working with hundreds of millions of records, we use yeah. EMR yeah. with um, Hi, and it works really well. Okay. And I guess that goes quite quickly as well. Yeah, you got to bump the table capacity up a lot because it will just basically go as wide as wide as you you, you want. Yeah. Typically, we we kind of don't want to, because well, it's a live production system, we typically don't want to absolutely hammer it, so we could typically run it if only a few nodes at a time. Yeah. But it has the capacity to you know, completely absorb the entire um, DynamoDB account limit of throughput very, very easily. Interesting. This will be an interesting uh, problem for us to solve when we get to, how many did you say? 20 million? Hundreds of million. Hundreds of million, yeah. Any more questions? Yeah, it's because you, you came from MongoDB, how do you compare the indexing in DynamoDB and the MongoDB one? Indexing? Yeah, the index, because MongoDB also have index. Everyone, welcome to this really Sorry. old <laughs> Kevin here. The question was, well, how do I compare indexes in Mongo with Dynamo? I'd say indexing in, in Mongo is much more like uh, in a relational database. You basically, you can query anything in Mongo, and Mongo will just do it. And it doesn't, and when, you're, when it's running on your, on your developer machine, you go, sweet, it's working, good, go push it to production. And then six months later, you find out there's a performance issue, and then the Mongo management console is starting to give you recommendations about indexes. I, and also, Mongo will let you build quite complex indexes that can support all sorts of complex queries. Um, yeah, DynamoDB is, it forces you, you cannot query at all until you create the index. So that gives you confidence as a developer that what you're building now is going to scale when you roll it out to production, even though you've only tested it on a small data set. Um, but it also has those additional constraints. You can't, you can't just query any existing data. You have to actually build out these computed attributes to, to satisfy the queries. That's the big difference. And how do you build a beta analytics if you start in DynamoDB? Well, you need to get it into an analytics platform. There's a bunch of options like Redshift or... So you send the data from DynamoDB to Redshift? We're not doing that yet. We're right. flying by the seat of our pants <laughs> without <laughs> analytics. We, we rely heavily on um, New Relic dashboards for insights. But we don't have accurate reporting built on our platform yet. Yep, thank you. We're we're using all automated because we're just flying underneath the free tier still. Okay. Yeah. It's very, very cheap the way we're using it. Yep. Yeah.
questions. Um, so thanks again, Nathan. That was a, a great introduction to DynamoDB.